How's it going, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the James Lab Podcast. And today, my uh, guest is Reggie Godino. How are you doing, Reggie? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, James. You're very welcome, man. I'm glad you're able to join us. Where are you joining us from? Uh, I live in San Diego, so I'm, and it's not sunny, so it's been really cloudy. <laughs> so. Wow. The first time I met you was probably around 2012 or 2013 at Steep Hill when you were over there in yeah. uh, Emeryville. We, we started out at Oakland, though, actually, right by the airport. So. Uh, the, well, and then it was Halent originally before Steep Hill. And, right. Well, there was so, Steep Hill, and then there was Halent, right? So Halent mm-hmm. was run by Don Land and Cameron de Cesar. Uh, yeah. They came from UC Davis, and and um, David Lampack had started uh, along with Addison Demora, right, right, and and Steve D'Angelo, right. Um, mm-hmm. They had started uh, Steve Hill, so and then right. they were they were like the the two big competing factions, and they combined, and that was the history was made. So, yeah, interesting times. It was that was the very infancy of uh, genetics and test uh, as far as testing genetics and COAs and all that stuff kind of came yeah. out of that, that era. Exactly. Right. And, and the first sex test on the market was from Steve Hill. Um, at one point there was a, I think it made it a weekend. We had a billboard up, up on the one Oh one and made it a weekend before they made us tear it down. Um, <laughs> about, you know, um, sex, you know, sex, your genetics. Right. So, um, and then uh, we followed that up a year later with the, the first CBD test, right? So, but but all of that was built on the fact that we had built that chemical database. Well, not not the sex so much as the, the sex was. We had some some buddies who who were willing to give up some males they didn't want. So we sequenced those when everybody else was sequencing females, right? Because everybody right. wanted you know the THC genes or whatever, and 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 we were like, well, okay, but but about like things like sex determination, does anybody care about that? Yeah. So now it's an interesting thing. I think once the price gets a little lower, I think it's going to, you know, it's, it's already pretty accessible for most people, but you know, once it gets even lower, everybody's going to use it. It just makes sense. Yeah. You know, um, talking about that, right. So, so, you know, and I think the COVID, you know, pandemic helped, right. A, A lot of, you know, a lot of stuff that was not mass produced in such quantities because it wasn't, didn't have, you know, like a day-to-day use in, in everyday life, right? You know, that whole idea of genetic testing and, you know, the the RNA testing that they use for the COVID is pretty much a lot of the same kind of work that we do, you know, for for like HPLVD testing. So it's an RNA virus as well, right? So, so um, you know, so now these things are being cranked out and the prices have gone down, right? So so the the cost of goods that it used to do, you know, we used to to cost us to run those tests has gone down because people are now you know dna primers you know for pcr or dime a dozen them right so some of the prices have really come down yeah um you still you 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 still need the people who know how to interpret the results though right so that's the right absolutely before covid people didn't even know what pcr was i mean the average person now everybody knows the the what pcr stands exactly, for exactly right so and and that's a sign of times and it's also a sign of why the prices are coming down and you know so back in the day um when we first started we 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 were at you know with our, our with our cost of goods we had to charge like 15 to 20 bucks for the, for the sex test right yeah. People are offering it for seven, eight bucks now. So, so tell me how you got started in the industry. It was a mistake, really. Or, or at the time, my day job was um, was the uh, senior patent advisor or the senior patent agent for um, a biotech company called Sequinome. So, Sequinome was the company that had invented prenatal diagnostic testing, so they could wow. do a complete fetal karyotype from the blood draw of a mother. So, as a side gig, I, I did. Uh, IP evaluation for other companies and David Lampack happened to be friends with my cousin um, back when they went to high school in New York and suffered in New York. I was like one town over in Muncie, New York, but I never knew I never knew David, right? So um, so David was talking to my cousin said, wow, I wish I had a, an IP guy I could trust. And my cousin said, well, my cousin's an IP guy. Why don't you talk to my cousin, right? So that's how I met David Lampack. And then 
Um, that was back in the time. I don't know if you guys remember Quantican, right? So Quantican was the first near IR, like, you know, instant, non-destructive, accurate measure of, you know, everybody's doing it these days, but, but Steve Hill had the first uh, near IR uh, uh, potency detector or, or, or evaluator. So, right. Um, so I came in, I did the evaluation for their IP and, um, unfortunately because they were already selling Quantican, they could no longer patent it. Right. So, um, and, and what I found was is they had this treasure trove of data they had been collecting for already the years they had been operating, you know, all of this database of chemotypic information from different varieties. Well, once you have a database, right, that's immediately how you start building markers, right? You look for the differences in the populations, right? Because that's a segregating, that, that gives you segregation of, uh, of genes, right? So, so, um, so I said to them, well, you can't patent this, but have you guys thought about doing anything with the data you're accumulating? Because you guys have a huge amount of data here that could be used for all sorts of stuff. And they, and they were like, well, like for what? I said, like, we're building breeding markers. And they were like, oh. And so they were like, well, what if we were to hire you to do that for us? And so um, that's how kind of it started. So um, my background is in, you know, molecular genetics and biochemistry. Um, right. I did, a, you know, that a gene jock, the whole nine yards. So, you know, I, I was at the very forefront of QPCR so when I started QPCR, it was a stopwatch and three different water water baths at different temperatures, right? You just lift your thing and, you know, instead of having the thing cycle, you cycled it. <laughs> so, wow. uh, um, so, you know, uh, a lot of the stuff that we do in terms of our market design and stuff like that is, is stuff that, you know, um, we have a very strong foundation for because of either my background or the data that we had already accumulated. And, and so, you know, um, that's kind of how it started. It was kind of an accident, right? I, I went for one thing, and then when they realized that I actually had a vision for what they had already accumulated, they were like, "Well, here, let's just hire you to do it." And so, nice. So, what kind, what kind of markers back then were you guys able to uh, identify? So the we had the first CBD test in the market. So, right. um, you know, and and not only that, but our CBD test was the first, and for a while, was the only one that actually pinpointed the ultra high kind of ratio the two, at the time it was greater than 20 to one like the acdc class right mm -hmm. All right so so our marker was actually specific for that class right so it, it was significant because you know it allowed you to start going down that farm bill hemp path right so right um we started uh looking for like varin markers um it was a long uh, row to hoe, um, and ultimately Phylos did a better job at it than us. But we we felt it faced all sorts of turmoil, at, you know, at Steep Hill, and that's how we ended up in Front Range and a whole bunch of stagnation kind of thing. So, um, right. but ironically, we found the BKR marker either around the same time or a little before anybody else. We just couldn't finish validating it because literally we we were in a spot where we were doing very little work because of very little money. And because we were also at the time kind of transitioning between hemp and going back to the THC markets. So now, you know, the company that I work for, while it was a big hemp company is no longer hemp focused. Right. So there's, a, there's always, always that, well, now you got to stop and then pivot. Right. So, um, wow. so there was a lot of that throughout our, our, our history. So how did the transition work from Steep Hill to Front Range? I guess you guys were acquired by Front Range at, at some point? Yeah. yeah. So in 2019, right? So this is, and and this kind of, this was forced by, you know, the, a change in the industry, right? When, when, when the BCC, well, the then BCC, now DCC rules came out and, you know, um, you know, the nature of the game changed, right? It was very hard for a, a testing lab making slim margins to support a, a full-on R&D program like, like we were, right? And at that time, I probably had probably eight or nine people in, in just my R&D program, right? So um, so uh, Front Range had made an, an inquiry because they were looking for that kind of 
being able to build markers and 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 you know having a science team to to drive a science driven seed development company right so so they uh, talked to to Steve Hill and and there was a deal made for you know some money and some stock and you know they got the IP uh, along with us right um, we got to front range and it was you know like we hit the ground running, right? Because, you know, we already had CBD marker. We already had a bunch of stuff. We had already had terpene markers and some of and some other pathway markers that were already, you know, in development and or either in development or already validated, right? And so, um, you know, they were um, at the time front range was, you know, going down the same road everybody else was, which was more, more CBD is more better, right? So we want right. that ha, ha, that higher CBD to THC ratio and everything else be down. Well, um, so, you know, we were able to get in, start screening their entire germplasm population. And then within the six, first six months of being there, we had screened everything and already um, had our first cross we got there it was just so happened that they were in the process of of getting to do seed um you know seed increases so they could for, to sell for the following year right so so we walked in and they already had plants ready pollen plants and and what we did was apply the the screening that we had done with the, with our markers and then better designed the crosses that they were going to do to be able to hit the mark that they wanted to do and, our, nice. and 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 within the first seed stock that came out, we already had hemp that was performing way better um, in terms of a number of parameters, right? So, um, and then and then that year we took all of that stuff and we did the largest field trial of hemp probably to this day, right? I don't think anybody's done it larger. Um, we had twenty seven twenty seven locations around the United States, oh. um, including five university partners. Cornell was one of them, and and a few others. And then we also went outside the United the continental United States. We had five locations in in Canada. We had Jamaica. We had Hawaii. We had Colombia, in South America. So, wow. so we 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 literally went whole hog, right? And I had aerial flyovers. We collect multi-spectral data. We did you know phantom testing. We did you know we had field agronomists go out to all the sites and to collect data. So like literally we went whole hog because if you're going to do Were you guys it, using drone technology for uh Yeah, we had flying drones stuff. in two locations. In, in, in one of our locations in Virginia and one of our locations in Colorado, we used hyperspectral imaging to, to look at fields. Yeah. Pretty amazing. The drone stuff is just kind of mind blowing for me yeah. still. So, 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 you know, we put together, you know, I mean, um, you know, we, we designed a, big ag type of model right so so to go out there and and, and the only way you're gonna you know I mean, you talk you know, how often have you heard well yeah i got shitty hemp seed from i i, I called this guy up and you know and he did he told me how great his stuff was in his state and but i'm in a different state and right so and it's the truth right so you know a lot of people can make decent hemp seed for their one state their one microclimate yeah. right but in order to have see that is successful in multiple locations right you have to do the work you have to put it there and grow it and observe it right and and you have to take good notes right because the other thing that you need to do is to figure out because of the huge amount of of hybridization and and just mishmash that you know some cannabis represents right there there is you know, photo period sensitivity, right? Like, so some stuff, when you put it in a short day is not going to do as good as some other stuff and vice versa for, for short night. Right. So, um, you know, so we learned a lot, you know, we, it was a huge undertaking, cost a lot of money. And I was immediately, immediately taken to test by the company for spending so much. I bet. <laughs> right. But at the, but the next year, right. When we sold our hemp seed, right? Nobody complained. We had we That's didn't have any any complaints. So, and it's unfortunately at that point that was kind of 2021 when the yeah. hemp industry went right. So yeah, and it's so competitive. Yeah. yeah, you have to have really better yeah. seeds. I mean, marketing just doesn't work anymore either. It's you know, yeah, it's like there's there's a handful of people producing really good seeds, and there's a billion seeds out there. Yeah. So. Yep. 
And and, and for, for a while, people were just giving this shit away. Ten cents a seed, five cents a oh, seed, yeah. a penny a seed, right? Well, Still. When, when I yeah. spent the year before, you know, a couple hundred grand running field trials, right? That's not yeah. going to fly. I can't, you know, there's no way to do that. So No, but at the same time, you can justify why your seeds are more expensive. Sure. And I feel like that makes a big difference. And, and moving forward, that's what people are going to have to do. That only that only matters to some, right? Because some people yeah. are like, "Oh, free seed, yeah, I'll take that." Right? So, yeah, yeah, and they, that's good for like the first year, and yeah. then you really, <laughs> you know, that that's what happened to a lot of people bought yeah. cheap seeds, and then they realized why they don't want to buy cheap seeds. Yeah, yep. you know, or they failed. There's a lot of failure over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. A lot of businesses going under, and uh, you know, and it's it's wild. Oregon and California and Colorado, you know, the the production, the amount of production is wild. It's very targeted, right? So if you, if you look at the USDA um, numbers, right? So yeah. we, we're still going down, right? So they predicted that the hemp industry would rebound by 2023 and you'd see an increase. Well, we had another twofold decrease in the number of hemp acres from 2022 to 2021 to 2022, right? So went from 54,000 acres to 28,000 acres, right? So wow. it's still going down. That's, yeah. that's that's the actual number of hemp acres planted in the United States total, right? Wow. So, <clears throat> yeah. So I, I mean, you look around. There's not a lot, of, a lot of a lot of those hemp companies don't exist anymore. So. Yeah, I mean, even some of the biggest ones that you never thought would fail are gone. You know, I can I can think of a few, and it's like, yeah. it, it's. It's just amazing. But I think everyone was thinking it was just going to grow, grow, grow. And that's just not how it works. Yeah. And then genetic lines become the tragedy here, right? Because right. as when people are looking to make the most money, spend the least amount because they're not sure where they're going to put their product anyway, so on and so forth. Nobody's buying $5 seed that, it, that even though if it's 5% CBC or mix, you know, 5% CBDV or whatever these things, right. Which actually ends up being the secret to making compliant hemp, right. Is so the more minor cannabinoids you have, the less THC you make. Right. So. Right. Yeah. There's nice. been some interesting cultivars created over the last five to yeah. 10 years. You know, I think Jen Canna had a zero THC that they were working on or had. A couple of companies. Um, yeah. Um, there was Panakia, which was a which was a zero. There was a Pure CBG, which was uh, was that Oregon was, CBD with they no, had that pure, for a while. You know, both of those companies. So one was from Hemp Trading, I think they're in Spain or somewhere in the Europe, and the other one was from from either Sweden or Switzerland. Some. So uh, the Varen, you are you guys still working on that at all? Or? I mean, I think that's still a hot topic a little bit, but it, it was, you know, it started about five years ago. People were really excited about it, yeah. the CBDV and THCV. Yeah. And so, yeah, we have, I mean, I've, we've, we've made cultivars. I got a whole bunch of stuff. I, I, I'm trying to integrate it back into, um, you know, everyday bud because I think people got a little carried away. So yeah, I have an eight to 10% producer as well, but nobody wanted to buy it. Right. And I, and I think, what we're seeing is that nobody has really adopted the Varens in any edible products or anything like that. It, it just hasn't grabbed on, right? But in the old days, right, you know, yeah. German poison, right, had super high. One yeah. to one to two percent, right? THCV, and everybody loved it, right? So I think there's a place for a good quality high THC bud with a couple to 3% THCV that I think is going to be like a a good daytime buzz, you know, kind of kicking in the pants kind of thing. Right. So, so we, we've been working on a couple of varieties right now. One of them is purple actually. So um, I had done some work with some red Congo a while back and I had, um, uh, which is a phenomenal variety. If you've never tried it, red Congo is. I love it. it. Yeah. My my friends grow it in San Francisco. It's amazing. It's super, it's super strong. Yeah. So super strong. Same thing uh, with the Durban. Um, so but but we used a red Congo base with our THCV producer, and now we have a few lines that are, you know, between one to three percent THCV, putting out, you know, twenty, twenty-two percent THC. And I'm gonna see if right. I can bring back Durban poison, dude, because you know I, I would love you, it if the real one came back. I think there's a right? lot of people that the, the problem is, is a lot of people, what they think is Durban poison is actually a hybrid of Durban poison that's been crossed with super silver haze. Yep. 
you know, and so everybody thinks it's this hazy plant and really it's this musky, you know, it's, it's powerful and, but it's not hazy and, and it's no, right. extremely like licorice. You know, I, we, we grew up Alice, with it. My, Alice. Yeah. yeah. So, so I actually had a cut. So I bred with that last year and I, I found a nice. cut that had that anise smell, that, that licorice smell. And so, totally. so yeah, so I'm, I'm stoked. I can't wait to, you know, to, to start, you know, going through that, that seed population, but, um, but yeah, no. So I'm right with you, man. Everybody keeps telling you. I'm like, dude, that smells sweet. That smells sweet. That's terpenaline. That's that's yeah. not. It's got the terpenaline limonene. Poison. That's no, no, that's not the real Durban poison. And I think it's greenhouse that actually we we can blame Arian and those guys yeah. over at greenhouse for that. You know, with the super silver haze. But I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really interesting what most people think of Durban poison, you yeah. know. And same thing with Red Congo. I've seen a lot of Red Congo that's not the real stuff. I mean, yeah. Red Beard and there's there's a handful of people in Northern California yeah. that actually sell the real Red Congo, you know. And I, I got to be careful with how much I smoke of the Red Congo because it's like one of those uh, cultivars that doesn't really have a ceiling, so you can keep getting more high mm-hmm. and more high and more high from it the more you smoke. Whereas a lot of the modern you know the the modern varieties that we're smoking has a like Skittles has a ceiling. You smoke Skittles, you can only get so high. But some of these, you know, and, and some of these land race varieties, some of these African varieties especially, they just have no ceiling. And you can smoke more, you can just you know they're almost psychedelic too. So right, so ironic that you said that. I got my red Congo germplasm because I was in the Berkeley area with the guys who were growing the real red Congo back in the day. And and, right. and, and I saved every seed I ever got from every ounce I ever bought from them. <laughs> so, that's so, awesome. So that's how I started. And um, and I actually had one, one of the seeds that I popped from that red Congo line. Like I, I uh, gave some cuts to a buddy of mine uh, who's what used to be a black market grower back in the day. And and he said he was, he had people tell him that it was like, they were tripping on the weed. Like, they were like dude, what is, oh, what, is this a place, dude? Like I, I was yeah. getting all sorts of, like, no, dude, that's just good weed. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So, it, but some of that gives people like heart palpitations. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah, it's not, it really almost gives you an edible, edible not, type effect. It's not for the faint of heart, right? It's no the real red Congo. Some of those African varieties are, are really not for the faint of heart, right? Cause they, yeah. they, 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 they will push the blood pressure up. They will get the heart going. They will, they're, they're more edgy. Right. So, right. so, but I like that feeling. I like, I like to feel like I'm jumping out of my skin. So. Yeah, and for me, it's like I like smoking this stuff sometimes, not all the time. Not when I'm doing podcasts. I did that once where we were like uh, laughing too much during the podcast. I was with Marlon Asher; he's a reggae singer, and good friend of mine, and we uh, we laughed pretty much for an hour, and we had a good time. But I think it, it wasn't well received. So <laughs> cool. But yeah, so uh, are you? You guys are working on some modern style genetics. Gel- I mean, gelato is kind of hot, and all these gelato derivatives is that's mostly what we see in the Bay Area. It's got to be purple candy gas. Yeah, and I, uh, so so the whole chasing THC is really, in my opinion, destroying cannabis. Right. So that yeah. that whole thing kind of annoys me, and and so I thought that I was going to buck the trend and make something really awesome. Uh, so we have a few things that came out of some of my red Congo crosses. One of them is called Watusi, and I swear to God, it's the best weed anybody's ever smoked, right? So, but really, it, but it won't hit above twenty-two or twenty-three percent, so nobody will buy it, right? But like all these guys who have who are cultivators for other companies have, oh, dude, I love this. I just can't yeah. sell it. I'm like, okay, well, you're not doing me any good, right? So, but no, but but I, I yeah. learned the hard way, dude. You you can't buck the trend. The industry is the industry, and, and unless you're playing the game. Right. So, so yeah, so yeah. now we're doing the gases and we're doing some of the candy and I got a bunch of purple shit. And so, um, but it's, you know, it's a little disheartening, right. That, that you can't bring forth something that is a superior product because it doesn't test right. You know? Well, so. and I think market awareness is part of it, but I also think that uh, education, like the, the, we have an uneducated market. And so they're really focused on hype, unfortunately. Uh, but that these things will change. I feel like everything goes in waves. I think the gas is coming back. I, I bred, a, I, I did some breeding with the shoreline and with the Fort Collins cough and some blue dream stuff. And, and, you know, some older genetics with the hype stuff. We did some selections and found stuff that has the look of what people want, but with unique flavor profiles. That, that's, that's exactly it. That's what we hear right now. So. 
we're going to have green flour again. People mm-hmm. are going to be okay with it. You know, I, you see it more so in like Washington than you do in California. I feel like that market's a little more educated. Same thing with Colorado to a degree. Well, you know, what's interesting is that everybody wants purple, right? But so purple anthocyanins are a less efficient form of chlorophyll, right? So a plant that's heavily purple will always test less, lower than a plant that is a, a equivalent pathway and green right so so yeah you got to take into account well you have different versions of the optimized pathway and so you have natural variation in, in, in cannabinoid content anyway right so but all things being equal if you had the same exact genetics in a purple plant a green plant the green plant would always test higher because it makes more energy because it's a better chlorophyll that's it right so we as an industry are confused right we want high thc and we want high terps well can't do that, right? You can't have the floral, the candy. Those are GPP-based terpenes. GPP makes THC, right? So you have a competition there, right? So this is why the high THC varieties tend to be more sesquiterpene heavy because that's a different precursor, FPP, right? That is not in competition to make THC. So it's it's as an industry, we're confused. We want things that you can't necessarily have because the plant doesn't work that way. <laughs> the American dream. <laughs> it's right. like, I always want stuff we can't have. And right. it's, yeah. And I think with education, I think these things will change, but also like when we're doing pheno hunting and we're going through the selection process, I try to give people joints now because I want to know what they're, I know what the, it looks like and I'm great at doing the selections, but let's talk about the taste and the effect. Right. And I think it just kind of puts everybody on the same page. Instead of giving people bags of flour, my friends bags of flour, or guys we're working with bags of flour to look at, and they can try it however they want. If you give them a joint, it's pre-rolled. Everybody's getting the same thing. Yeah. No. Yeah. And then they don't they don't get to look at the color. I can I can identify if the color is the the right color or not. Or well, you, you know what's so. interesting though. So, uh, God, I, I I wish I wish I could sit you in front of all of the people that were naysaying me before, right? So <laughs> I'm like, why do you guys need to see see a COA, right? Like, why can't you guys take it, smoke it, and then make a determination without seeing a number? Did you like it? Did it do you right? Did it, did, did you have the right experience? So, and if if it passes that all those tests, what the fuck do we care what percent THC was? So back in the day, I, when I was 12 and 13 years old, you know, even 15 and 16 years old, smoking Panama Red, Acapulco Gold, because that was the shit back in the day, right? Like, dude, none of that stuff ever tested more than 12%, maybe 14%. Right. right? Oh, yeah. But even even Sour Diesel, when I had it tested at Halent in 2012, I had the highest testing outdoor Sour Diesel. I still have the COA, but it was only like 24% was the top. That was like the top that year. So... Right. But, yeah, people, you know, and it was amazing stuff. And then sour diesel only tests at fourteen percent. Right. The, the stuff we were growing back in the day, right? Right. So, so clearly, we didn't need astronomical THC numbers to get a good experience out of cannabis, right? We didn't, right? right? And 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 the nature of cannabis is is changed, right? So, you know, you had you if you you know, it, it's been a long time, and I'm sure you know some of this is rose colored memory, right? So. Um, but you know, right. you open up a bag and and there of good weed, and there was a deep, complex fragrance, right? You don't get that anymore. You get like a couple of notes because yeah. literally you've only got a, a handful of terpenes of which one or two are, are of significant content, right? Like you know, what when 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 the majority of weed is only one and a half, what one point two to one point eight percent terpene content and we consider top shelf two and a half percent terpenes well dude yeah. right 2019 what was the grease monkey had five percent terpenes right right I, I had i had stuff from outdoors this year that hit three and a half percent terpenes like yeah. you know so, so what what are we doing to ourselves right I, but anyway, whatever so I, I don't mean to yeah. derail the conversation. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Yeah, it's a it's a real interesting world we live in, you know. And I think, yeah, like I was saying about the education, and and I think market demand changes over time. 
But yeah, I remember stuff back. The, the best stuff we had in the 90s was the ugliest. It was the cat piss. We had this cat piss, and the cat piss looked like it was basically Brax in a bag, and they, there might be some stems in there, but it was sticky. And it, the one little gram of it would smell your whole house up. Right. You, you don't get that anymore. And, yeah. you know, it was $60 an eighth back then, straight up. There, there was no discounts on it. It, right. it was hard to get. It would sell out and you wouldn't be able to get it for a few months. Yep. Yeah. Well, so. you, know, you know, what's interesting about that is that <clears throat> that brings up another point, right? So we talk about nose. We talk about bag appeal, right? Yeah. yeah you know, things like cat piss, baby shit, right? Like, so yeah. th- th- those are the, as far as we go in terms of the almost but not quite borderline unacceptable fragrance in our weed right totally dude body are, odor you know right, all these right. things they're, they're foul right. to a lot of people but then if as a connoisseur you like that kind of stuff well there are forty thousand fucking terpenes dude <laughs> and, yeah. and, and some of them smell really bad some of them smell yeah. like vomit some i mean like right so so and 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 so i'm just left thinking about through all of the you know because we've we found you know, high THC cannabis going back 2,500 years in some ancient Chinese emperor's tomb, right? Okay, great. So, um, so when did the selection against really bad smelling cannabis start? That's what I want to know. (laughs) (laughs) Because we, we, there's nothing that smells really bad in cannabis, but there are all sorts of genes for terpenes that you would expect to find, right? In potentially in cannabis that, you know, we have some borderline smells, right? There's like the, the, the cheese, which kind of, you know, depending on what it's combined with, smells like dirty feet, right? Which is, you know, borderline. Right. And, and we still see these expressions. Right? I mean, we call yeah. them out, you know, but we're yeah. still seeing some funky stuff in there. Yeah. I mean, even these menthol ones, I don't I don't particularly like menthol, yeah. you know, expressions in my flower. But, you know, I think there's an interesting side yeah. to that, too, so... That's funny. A couple of years back, I, so I, I I had a cut of Mendo breath that um, yeah. oh no no it was called Teach Me Terpenator. It was as it was a strain from Oregon, but it, it was from the it was from the Mendo breath line, right? Yeah, um, dude, it was straight up fucking Ben Gay, like literally, like the like yeah. you broke open the buds and it was like you were sniffing Ben Gay, right? And it was the weirdest smoke because it gave you kind of like this almost like menthol flavor in your lungs, right? It was the weirdest, yeah, no, but 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 it it's cool because, you know, the important thing about terpenes, right, is that is that they they kind of set the body up for the experience, right? So right, right. So so the, the terpene profiles are really important, much more important than I think people really understand sometimes, right? So like certain terpenes, like certain terpenes are actually having physiological effect in your biochemistry, right? Like Alpha pinene is an ACH inhibitor, right? Which is which leads to increased focus, increased energy, right? So, so literally, there are these. There is a biological reason why the terpenes do affect you the way they do, and if we understood that better, right? Like we'd be so much more in tune with what terpenes do we have than how much THC do we have, right? Because you can have high THC weed with very low terpenes and feel the same as lower THC weed with higher terpenes, right? So Right. Yeah, it's pretty wild. And then jumping into that, it's like the conversation with indica and sativa. And yeah. I feel like stimulant versus sedative is a much better description these days because everything's so hybridized. Yep, yep, yep. And, uh, you know, at one point, it made a difference, right? At one point, you yeah. generally found sativas, tall and lanky, always had yeah. a kind of more uplifting cognitive thing. And then... The short, stocky ones generally where it made you couch lock and kind of, right, you know, yeah. stone, right? So not the case anymore. As soon as as soon as people started putting the tall and the short ones together and making babies, it all went out the window, yeah. dude. So, so Yeah, we got one that looks like Bubba Kush, but it smells like uh, Jack Herrera. Oh, nice. So, so that, that's that's a terpenaline dominant then. So that's pretty cool. Totally. So. Ter- yeah, terpenaline. Yeah. It's got yeah. a lot of limonene and terpenaline. Beauty. Yeah. But but it looks like a it looks like an indica. Like if you were to take a picture of it and put it in a book, people would think it was some Afghanica indica yeah. variety. So, so so you know what's interesting about this is that you know and and there are there are kind of like vestigial organs, you know, like the ones you don't use anymore. There are actually a few vestigial terpene families, right? That 
uh, we found through some of our work, which are very interesting, that are are like the sativa gene, right? Like, wow. so literally, it's a terpeniline gene that has this set of minor terpenes that are made out of the same gene that are all strictly sativa, three carrying alpha philandrine, all of these things that are hard sativa kind of terpenes, right? And like we found this one terpenaline gene that made all of them. So it's literally like, well, yeah, so we actually can select for a sativa, you know, kind of phenotype. If we yeah. if we have this gene, we know it's going to be that type of phenotype, right? So it's it's that level of of understanding that allows us to do really really hardcore predictive bread for effect kind of cannabis. Now think about that, right? So now we're not just pheno hunting, right? We're setting up crosses with a purpose because we have we we have known genes that are doing known functions, and we want to carry that through to be able to achieve an effect, right? That's, that yeah. changes the nature of what we do, right? If you think about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can select for it or you can not select for it because you've identified it. Right. Exactly. So it, so it allows people to actually start to have more confidence when they pick up that pre-roll that says chill or energy. Yeah. You know, with that depth of information, the people can, who can now offer those things that are, will be 100% spot on and, and people, the majority of people who, who you know, with the right ECS conditions, right? So because there are there, yeah. I, I have I have a few friends that convince me that they are wired backwards, like stuff that makes everybody else jump up and down puts them to sleep. Stuff that totally. puts everybody else to sleep makes them jump up and down, right? So I, I'm not sure how that happens, <laughs> you know, what what yeah. got what got messed up in those people's you know endocannabinoid system, but but for the most part, right? You can you can say 85 percent or better of the population will respond this way and if you were to question those people you'd be able to get responses that indicated that so and we're close to that right and 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 that's where we start to cross over from just cannabis as a potential you know healing agent to a yeah i can treat myself for various things conditions yeah. whatever because i understand how this thing plays in my biochemistry right you know, anti nociception pain relief. There are certain chemicals in cannabis that that yeah. do that job, right? We know what they are, so it's cool. I, I can't wait to see where we are in five years. So, yeah, I mean, we're getting closer. Israel is so you know they're they're further ahead with us in a lot of ways, but I think we're definitely catching up. Well, they're they're definitely ahead on the medical side, right? So I, I right. think in terms of variety creation and 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 just the the new new you know like the new yeah. hot shit i think we still we, have an edge there absolutely so, there, yeah there's nothing yeah. that compares to what we're doing here and there's just so many people you know breeding and making a, yeah i don't know if you could even call it breeding but they're doing seed production breeding whatever they're making new genetics all over the place yep. you know on so many levels from the guy who's doing it at home and, and it's not like that over in israel but as far as like drug discovery on the medical side yeah you They're know, Daddy Miri, the stuff he's doing over there, it's it's Daddy, it's pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've yet to have a conversation, literally, where Daddy's name has not come up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I love the guy, right? So he's an awesome guy. So yeah. um it does great work. And but 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 literally that he is the epitome of making something like you know, applied academic research work. Dude, I, I met Daddy at this first Canatech, right? And, and that's when, you know, and he and I became friends since then, right? So, and <clears throat> took me through his lab, dude, this is 2013, 2014, maybe, right? Like right. he already had cell lines, immortalized cell lines, then he was already using, you know, extracts from different varieties. And uh, dude, I mean, like, it, it, you know, it's, it's well-planned, well-thought-out science, in a regime yeah. where, yes, let's consider this as a medicine and see what we can do, right? That's as opposed yeah. to- Yeah, there's just have. so much red tape, less less red tape over in Israel than there is here. It's just, you know, and, you know, we're still having politicians argue whether it could be medical or not, which is pretty yeah. wild. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about autoflowers a little bit. You've done some work with autoflowers over the years, and are you guys working on autoflowers now? And tell us a little bit about it. So we 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 did um, 
um, it, it wasn't our main focus. Um, it, it served two purposes. It, it served for us to be able to um, develop a mapping population and so that we could start to map that autoflower gene, right? So or our flowering time genes in general, right? So we've had a marker for a couple of years, right? You know, and it was actually, I, I ironically, we never published on it because we drug, dragged our feet and we wanted to do more work. And, and now that we got scooped on it and we're going to have to do more work to be able to publish what we had in the first place. <laughs> so, uh, but, but yeah, so the, the FT gene that, that people are talking about now, you know, we had a, a marker for it probably by two years ago. We're doing more, more work with that marker to kind of to see what what allelic variants there are, you know, and 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 to kind of you know, I think we what we where we didn't see far enough was we didn't anticipate that there might be a, a tandem duplication like these guys found. So 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 now we know that there's you know there's potentially a a gene copy number component to flowering time. You, strains that only have one copy or longer flowering strains that have two copy or fast flower potentially auto flower. <laughs> so we tried to a, a while back use uh combined auto flower and varins and yeah. um i made a bad choice in one of the parents so ushjo is in fact auto flower however it's a shitty plant to work with <laughs> it set me back yeah. over a year <laughs> like wow. literally it set us back like a year so um we went back and we were trying we were trying to make auto flower cbdv basically right so um yeah and yeah, um, there's a couple of people yeah. working on that. I think Nick Stromberg was doing some stuff. And yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so Nick goes back to Steve Hill. So, so Nick, we helped Nick way back. Um, um, because at the time, the only way to, to detect THCV was, was through chemistry, and we were the first lab to be able to detect THCV actually, Steve Hill. So, so we worked with Nick. Nick, Nick and I go back a long way, and Nick goes back a long way with Steve Hill. So, he, you know, yeah. in fact. In fact, at one point, I think he may have worked with either Halent or us. I'm not sure, but he had free reign. You know, he used to come in and run samples on our machines. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He worked. I mean, he got his degree from Davis. So, yeah. So makes sense. Um, yeah, there were a lot of people interested in it back then, right? So, so we we all had a connection to Doug Jenks, who who was the guy who developed, um, you know, Doug Zarin, right? So, which was that that the the real first I think talked about high fairly high thcv and even back then it wasn't that high it was making like four to seven percent but you know it was a one-to-one -one, so it was making about four to seven percent thc as well right so um <clears throat> um but it was it was a blast of smoke it tasted like crap but dude would hit you hard man Oof. yeah so. i got some uh some uh extract that was pure thcv that was pretty interesting oh really it's you hard yeah 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 from, from nick actually oh really so yeah, it's interesting where all these uh, cannabinoids are going to go in the future. Yeah. There's, there's, dude, there's so many. So CBC has known, you know, uses. Uh, the Varens, you know, with the, yeah. with, because it's not only the, like the, the appetite suppressant, right? But, but they've already got, um, I think it's in mice models or rat models where they showed like diabetes type two, like in a, in a, in a mouse model that, that T, administration of THCV helps, you know, regulate blood sugar and some other stuff so so dude, there's a lot of work that can be done with cannabinoids right we just need as a country to get off our fucking asses and and and, and accept the fact that this is not the demon that it was made out to be it has a lot of good uses uh right. and 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 free the plant and let us do some research right so um totally yeah. yeah so where do you see the industry going in the future you know over the next five years i mean you have a pretty great perspective from from the stuff you're working on as far as genetics. You know, I I thought I did, but I but I I I don't, dude. I don't. I, James, let me tell you, like I I had a conversation with the CEO of my company yesterday, and I saying, "What the hell do we need to do to get people to buy our weed?" Right. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> so you know, the industry is a fickle beast. Um, but I, I think where everybody everybody has to go, right? Because at the end of the day, this is farming. I, you know, I know it's, nobody likes when I say that, right? But this is agriculture, right? So, so an agriculture becomes commoditized, right? So, so at the end of the day, down the line, people are going to be concerned about their cost to produce, right? Because they're going to be squeezed on margins. 
Right. Clones are not the way that happens, dude. Clones are the most expensive way to cultivate cannabis that you can do. And this is why sure. no big cash crop, well, I take that back, roses and some other ornamentals, sure. right? But for the most part, most things that are grown outdoors or it's most things that are grown <clears throat> in large greenhouses, right, are not, with the exception of things like coffee, because sure. every single coffee tree has a very different flavor profile right so but but for the most part you're 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 growing stuff from seeds you may not plant the seed yourself you may buy your germinated seeds and little things right that right uh, right but but the cost the cost to produce seed is far cheaper than the cost to produce clones right so where everybody will have to go is to stabilize seed because nobody is going to want to throw out a thousand seed and get you know 50 different varieties right yeah so, nobody wants that right sure. so so st so further inbred stabilization right so yeah to, genetically to make, stable yeah. seeds yep right which can which with uh, with the the use of snip chips that are being offered by my company and other companies with you know marker assisted breeding you, you can make do some real damage and you can get some very directed kind of corral germplasm populations yeah. to work with right and, and and have a much better chance of achieving things that you want. And and so now the work begins. You either are going into an inbreeding program so that you can now create F1 hybrids that are have the full, you know, hybrid vigor that we see now when we throw things together and say, oh my God, that thing's fucking a huge producer. Well, yeah, dude, you just did right. the hybrid vigor thing, right? So oh. um um, and so I, I think that's one of the things, but I think the other thing we're going to have to see is, 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 you know, dark heart was doing it. Oregon CBD was doing it. Manipulation Rest in of peace, dark of heart. Ploidy, right. So, yeah. um, where you're starting to make triploids so that people can't steal your shit, but more importantly, right. And then I'll get to triploids in a, in, in a minute and why I think some companies who ran into it early did it wrong. Right. So, um, Agreed. but then also, the whole double haploid breeding thing, right? Because you, it, it, we, we are not in the spot where we can take eight to twelve years to stabilize, you know, to to get to an F eight F nine, you know, right? So that we have, you know, greater than ninety percent of the seed looking the same when you when you throw them out in the field, right? So, so double haploid breeding gets us, you know, cuts that down to a year and a half, two years, right? You know, and that includes actually true to type testing after the fact to make sure you have the right things, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that's where everybody has to go. Otherwise, otherwise, right? You know, more and more people will fail because they're paying cutting fees on their clone on their moms, or they're having huge mother rooms so that they can have get enough cuts to be able to run that fourteen hundred, you know, plants in that bay that time, right? So. Uh, or they're paying, you know, uh, a, a lot of money to companies like Node and, and Conception, and, and, and you know, for yeah. for clones, you know, eight ten dollars a clone, clone or so, whatever. Yeah, I mean, right. So you know, so double haploid. You want to talk about double haploid a little bit? Sure. Yeah. For yeah. for the viewers that aren't familiar. Sure. So double haploid breeding is <clears throat> where you take. It's called anther culture, right? So you take. So you take whatever variety, and then if it's not a male already, you you make it you, you make it produce anthers, right? So you take that anther and you, you those anthers and you culture them, you know, on agar like tissue culture, and you get callus, and then from there, um, you know. So now you got to remember that anthers, the sex parts are haploid; they're not diploid in the cell, right? So, um, so you 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 then take that callus and you do somatic embryogenesis. And so you get a regenerate from that, just like you would from a regular tissue culture callus, right? Um, <clears throat> except that because it came from anther and not from a diploid tissue, it's a haploid tissue. So you get a haploid plant, right? So you, you can then take that haploid plant, right? And cross it back to itself, right? That, you know, or, or, or cross to some other haploid plant, right? If you don't if you don't cross it back to yourself, then you're not really making the double haploid, right? So you're you're just out crossing in a different way. But um, but you cross it back to itself, and then what you end up with is a plant that is 100 percent homozygous at every loci, right? So what happens to that plant? Well, that plant looks nothing like the plant you took it from, right? So because it's now 100 percent homozygous at every at, at, at every loci. 
the plant that you were using to you know was not 100 homozygous at every low size so now what you got to do is you got to go through and you got to find the combinations because you're not just doing it with one plant right and then now that you've got these 100 homozygous lines that you've created from this anther culture and remember every anther is the rule of independent disharmony right so it's not like you get one genotype out of an anther right so because the so so there's still a lot of phenotyping, the, the marker-assisted, you know, kind of, you know, selection to make sure you have the right things. But once you then breed those two 100% homozygous things together, you end up with the best version of an F1 hybrid, right? So, because it's, it, it and, and you see the kind of hybrid vigor that people refer to when they say F1 hybrids, right? So, what we typically do in cannabis is not really a true F1 hybrid. A true F1 hybrid is is, is from inbred lines, right? Right. So totally stable, stable lines. Right. Right. So, so, so that's what what ha double haploid breeding allows you to do. It allows you to cut that inbred line development, which takes a long time, into a very short period of time, right? But there's still a lot of evaluation that has to happen, right? Because part of the inbred line process is picking the best ones as you go down to, to continue doing the breeding with, right? So now right. that you've created this population of haploid genomes, right, that you're going to now make diploid by mating to itself, right? You now have to look at, well, what combinations did I get and how do I put those together to make good seed, right? But that seed that comes out is 100% identical. Everything in that population from that next cross is 100% identical. And so now you get you throw you throw your thousand seed out there, and 999 at the very least are looking the same. And that's wow. what we need to get to to be able to really dry the price down. Because when you, you get to that point, you know, even if it's top notch seed, right? You're going to be, you know, in bulk, you're going to be paying a couple, three bucks a seed as opposed to eight, 10, 12 bucks a cut, right? So, yeah. <clears throat> so, and then what are your thoughts on AI for predictive models and stuff like that? So, AI is good if you have good input data, right? So, so they've, they've tried to do a lot of AI modeling with terpenes, and I think they haven't had a lot of success. They've had some success, but not a lot because garbage in equals garbage out, right? So unless you have very well curated chirping data and not everybody does the same job and all and the same thing for all that stuff, right? So so AI has potential use assuming you have good input data, right? And I think the way things have been going in the industry with elevated numbers and so on and so forth, I don't think there's good data to be able to really to, to do any good AI modeling, right? I who have in my my own data for my own work, um which is very well curated. I have a data scientist whose job is nothing but to tell me what is my good data and my shitty data, right? And even he is not at the point where he thinks we have data that's sufficient for AI modeling without heavy handholding of the model. So, uh, so, so I, I think it's I think it will get there at some point. You either need a good amount of really outstanding data, or you need shit tons of poor data or or mediocre data right yeah. and 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 to be able to 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 work through all of the the the, the falsehoods right so so and I, and I don't think there's and there may be enough data like if every lab in the world got together and dumped all their shit into a big repository and set some ai engine on it it'd probably do a decent job right but i yeah. but but we but we're not at that level of cooperation where everybody's just dumping all their data into a single repository yet so yes it's 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 interesting. I mean, we're we're just starting to scratch the surface with some of this stuff. And yeah, as I was discovered describing double haploid breeding before, I, I kind of badmouth triploid stuff. So it's funny because you know a lot of people went and did triploids. They thought it was the thing to do. Well, because now you you know you know you won't get C. Well, if your shit didn't harm, you wouldn't need triploids to take care of that problem, right? So they're totally. right, right, right. So there's well, if there your was neighbors, way to if your neighbors' shit didn't right? harm so, too, you know. And and traditionally, triploids are used at the end of a breeding cycle, right? So, and, and because now you've done all this work, you have your inbred lines, right? You yeah. you you know what your F1 hybrid seed is going to look like. So now you take one of those parents. And you make it a quadruploid, you breed it to the diploid equivalent, 
diploid version of it, and you have a triploid seed that exhibits the exact phenotypic stuff that you needed to exhibit, right? Yeah. So I don't think anybody had weed of any kind, CBD or THC dominant, that was at that end of the cycle breeding kind of path. You know what I'm saying? Right. Makes so, perfect sense. So, so, so it was really used to solve a problem, right? That could have been solved other ways. So that's yeah. my, that's my opinion. So. Yeah. I don't think we're quite there with the, the triploids yet, yeah. but yeah, I mean, the, the concept is great. It works great for watermelons. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's a great example, right? So, so when you make triploids, right, not so, you know, you either have complete triploids or, or, or partial triploids, right? Like, like for instance, you know, Mac one, right. Uh, is, yeah. is a partial triploid. Right? So, so, and boy, was that hard. I, I tried to breathe with that and I could never figure out until I figured out that it was a partial triploid. I'm like, God damn it. Why, why are 95% of all my seed immature fucking duds? Like I, I would, yeah. I would harvest like a thousand seed and like 50 would be good, would be mature. Right. So, um, yeah. SFV is like that too. Is, uh, uh, yeah, SFV cultivar. Yeah, yeah. So when you look at fruit that's been triploided, right? Yeah. Like you have to be careful. Like not every triploid is going to be increased mass, better sweetness, right? Like you yeah. you really have to make sure that the triploid combination that you have is giving you something that you want, right? Like yeah. you know, so otherwise you just have a triploid and and. And that's not making seed, but is it really a better plant, right? Like, I mean, sure. the, the the reason you use triploid is to get something extra, right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so. increased vigor, increased right. yield, increased no flavor, seeds. no seed, increased exactly, flavor. right? Yeah. The, the no seed part is important, yeah. But if that's all you're using it for, then you're kind of wasting the technology, right? So, right. And so, yeah, they'll be there eventually. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's probably yeah. enough people working on it. Well, we have to, right? So if, if if we want to survive, you know, I mean, I hate I would hate to see this become the future of the cannabis industry, right? But yeah. you know, I'm I'm sure you've heard people talk about how there's gonna be this split in the industry. You're gonna have like the small craft beer guy, and then you're gonna have the big box beer guy, right? Like it's already happening. Right? You think it's happened to a degree already? I I think so. And I, I mean I personally think so, and I I, I kind of like to see it going that way with uh, terroir and stuff like that. If we're talking about Humboldt and Mendocino and mm -hmm. these guys with their specific genetics that they grow that are specific to that region and make it more like wine and, and beer. I mean, I like that model. Uh, you know, but I, so yes, yeah, so so as long as that model is well regulated, right? Because just because, right? right you know. You, you can't take some dirt from Humboldt, go to L.A. and grow it in L.A. and say, oh, this is Humboldt grown. No, it's not, because now temperature is yeah. different. Humidity is different. You know, insulation yeah. is different. Right. Like, you know, so so remember, this was the, a few years ago they were talking about this stuff and they wanted, you know, for sure that they, they wanted to have the terroir map of, of the Humboldt, you know, and the, yeah. gold, the, the Emerald Triangle up there. And, you know, they had asked me to to consult on that whole program you know um when i was with ncia and i was like uh, you guys don't want me to consult because i'm gonna i'm gonna ruin everybody's party dude because you yeah. guys want you you guys want to be able to say oh yeah it's this variety you know grown under licensed by this guy and i'm like well that's not that's not terroir that has nothing to do with it dude that i mean terroir right. means you grow it in that spot th yeah. this is your region and you can't grow it outside that region Right? Because exactly. if you grow it out to that region, it changes it, right? So, so yeah. So anyway, um, you know, because terroir is very, it's so complicated, dude. It's 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 soil microbes, it's mineral content, it's yeah. hum, it's it's so many it's things. Humidity, right? so, elevation, all these yeah. things come into play for sure. Yeah. So, um, the yeah. idea is a great idea. It's a great we'll see idea how it gets executed. If, it, if yeah. it's done right, if they do it like they do, provinces in. France for wine, right? Like, like literally, you can grow the same grape in in two provinces that are next to each other. In fact, one there is this is actually what happens. There's a wine called Macon Village and another um, wine called Puy Fusi, right? And yeah. literally, it's the same grape. The two places are next to each other on the map. Yep. Right. But because they have a line down the middle, and there is a slight difference in the 
I think it's the acidity or some mineral content. Uh, you know, this county has more of one thing than this county does. Literally, right? right? Different wines can't call them the same. So yeah, and, and cannabis will do the same thing. If you had the same growing techniques in two right. regions right next to each other, one that was up a little higher or lower, yeah. you're going to get different expressions. Yeah. And so, so this leads to something else, right? Why brand names need to go. And I know nobody's going to like to hear that, right? So yeah, absolutely. Right. But, but it's based on what you just said, the chemistry, right? So you take Blue Dream and you grow it up in Humboldt and you grow it in LA. So you expect to have the same chemical output? No, right? Because it's phenotype is equal to genotype plus environment, right? Right. So literally, Blue Dream may not look like Blue Dream if it's grown in two different places, right? So you'll get, yeah, so you'll get a different chem- expression. You? Yeah, well, and then besides that, it's like so these guys are selling packs of seeds, right? The, these retailers, yeah, including myself. But you're you're selling a pack of seeds, and somebody pops one, and they call it Blue Dream, and then someone pops another one from that same pack, they also call it Blue Dream. You're getting a different expression. Blue Dream is a bad example because it's a little more stabilized, but like right, a lot yeah. of this. Gelato, you know, because Blue Dream, you get basically with the S ones, you're getting four expressions. That's pretty much it. They lean right. towards one of these four expressions. But with yeah. something like Gelato 33, you put it, yes, you, know, you self Gelato 33, you pop ten seeds, you get ten different expressions. Hell yeah, dude! You pop twenty seeds, you're probably going to get twenty different expressions. So, and that's and that's the problem, right? So everybody, you know, so don't get me wrong. I don't want to say it's a problem, uh, yeah. but it's a challenge, right? But it's also what leads to. S- such amazing diversity that we see everybody's always got every year there's always something new coming out right so yeah so so it, it helps us in a way right but we 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 have to be careful about whether or not we're over hybridizing everything right and For sure we we'll, are, but... we'll eventually lose distinctions right so how how, how many bakery products do we need, right? Yeah. Like, you know, dessert, so, right? yeah, all these, yeah. Right? Or, or Candy, how many dessert. ice creams do we need, right? And they're and and, yeah. and they're all made by banging the same plants together, right? And so yeah. that's where we start to have problems with, you know, genetics and uh, and who knows, right? Some of these, we're not, we don't study this kind of stuff because nobody sure. really studies anything to any depth in genetic in, in cannabis because we, you know, to be trying to make money, right? So, um. But how much inbreeding depression have we already seen, yeah. right? And it's contributing to some of these hard to grow strains and and hard to work with strains because, right? Literally, we have been banging the same shit together over and over and over and over again, right? So, right, things like hoplite and viroid. Yeah. You know, I think, yeah, hoplite and viroid's been a hot topic for the yeah. last couple of years, but especially now, it's like it's decimating. Some people, and it's you know, it might express on a branch, it might express on a plant, or a row, or a whole room. Yeah. But uh, you know, and that's a problem. But I mean, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you know, with with all this genetic depression that's going on from inbreeding, I mean, a lot of people don't think they're inbreeding; they're crossing this with that. But then the plant's more susceptible to things like hoplite and viroid and different pests and other pathogens. There's some evidence that different cannabis lineages have different levels of resistance to hops late and viroid, right? So yeah, I don't think anybody's got a real handle on it, but you know, but we, we've done a lot of work with it and we've, we've actually, you know, at one point when we were a hemp company, we, we, we were running a, a cleaning program where we would, you know, we had some of our varieties that we were working with. Um, we put them into our tissue culture program and, and actually ran, you know, some thermal cleaning Remediation. protocols. Yeah. And and we're able to show significant decreases in the level of hops latent viroid after one cleaning. Like one of the one of the lines was seventy five percent reduced. One was sixty percent. Another one was like forty percent. And there were some lines you could not clean at all, at all. Right. So so clearly there are genetic differences that if we understood better, we could in fact work with to produce more resistant plants now whether that resistance is due to like a a pathogen kind of gene or whether it's because it's producing certain terpenes or not right it, it, and remember terpenes are in fact the kind of like the, the plant's immune system right so it's definitely an avenue that we we should be looking at now the way you're saying it is is are we seeing less resistance to 
HPLVD because we have been doing all of this damage to the genetics through inbreeding and, and depression? That's a great question. And I don't know if anybody's ever yeah. thought of it that way, right? But the more we've started to focus on the gelatos or the gorilla glues and the cookies and breeding those lines, suddenly we're seeing this increase in HPLVD. It's almost it's almost like it's occurring at the same time. So while I don't right. know for sure that there's any support for that, it certainly fits the available observation, right? So there's definitely seems to be a correlation between, you know, it, there's been a much bigger spike, but you could also be, potentially attribute that much bigger spike to the now it's legal in so many states. Do it. So when, when my company licensed Panakia from hemp trading in Spain, the first thing we did when we got the cuts was run HPLVD tests on it. They came to us from Spain with HPLVD. Wow. Yeah, and it's transmissible through clones and even seeds. I mean, they're yeah. they're proving that it, you know now that it's transmissible through seed as well. Yeah. So so do they uh, change that number? I haven't read up on that recently, but the last time I heard it was like eight to ten percent transmission. Is, is is it still that low, or, or are they it, are people? That's what higher? I've heard. Is I, I've heard eight to ten percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Which is still a good percent, right? Like, you, so that means yeah, one, yeah. If, if you if you're dealing with two infected plants, that means one out of every ten seeds has the potential to start bad, right? Like, that's that's yep. not good. So, yeah, and I mean, I think a lot of people aren't testing for it either, and they're just assuming and, and yeah. you know ignoring it, and it's something that needs to be identified. And yeah. you know, I think that's another thing with awareness. You know, people, you know, they start seeing, and the thing is, is a lot of these cultivators, they see it on one branch, right? So you see it on one branch, you get a dudded branch, no big deal. Then you start seeing dudded plants and you have to cull those. But, you know, and it can, it, it's funny because unless you're using bleach to sterilize your tools, if you have it in your room, you're just going to spread it everywhere. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. Even with, with irrigation, if you're, if it's passing through the water from one plant to the next, you could spread it that way. So. Yep. Uh, so. You know, and then, and what was it? Kevin from Medicinal Genomics just yeah. like two days ago had the paper that leaf hoppers are carriers, right? So they, yeah, yeah, I saw that. they ground up wild. some leaf hoppers and found the virus, in, the viroid in the, in the leaf hopper, right? So, so, and so think about this though, right? So the main mode of transmission previously was mechanical, right? You snip a plant, you don't wash them good, you snip another plant, bang, right? Well, Who's washing the mandible parts of the insects that eat biting our plants, right? So now you fi you you, you yeah. find it on leaf hop you find it in leaf hoppers, right? Well, what about all the other plants that happily munch on cannabis, right? It's not a virus, right? It's not like it has to go in and infect and then get protein coat and then lice the cell, right? It's literally an RNA, yeah. an infectious RNA. It gets in if it you know through some sort of mechanical transmission. So if a bug is on a dirty plant and hops to a clean plant and bites that yep. clean plant, why wouldn't its mandibles or or proboscis or whatever it's sticking in the plant to eat, right? Why exactly. wouldn't it potentially have the same ability to transfer that the scissors that we're using to cut are, do, right? Like, and before there was no bona fide insect, you know, transmitter. Now we know that at least there's one, right? So now it's time to keep our eyes open. I grow, yeah. I grow, I, I grow outdoors, dude. I, I find. I find crickets like huge crickets like happily munching on my cannabis, right? So, oh, yeah. you know, can crickets carry it too? Like, if it bites a bad plant, will it transmit to a good plant? So, yeah. You know. Well, and I think if you have a tissue culture lab, if you're if you're blessed enough to be a cultivator that has a tissue culture lab and you can keep clean germplasm, you know, it's it's going to make a huge difference moving forward. Yeah, yeah I work with Apical Biotech. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. With who? Uh, Apical Biotech from Justin from Apical oh, Biotech yeah, yeah. and they they do remediation and they do a really good job with it and you know they have they have tests that prove that they're actually remediating with mere yeah. stem excision so yeah. there's so much misinformation disinformation and lack of information right and and we need to change Absolutely. that so drastically so drastically um, yeah. you know in order to you know we we, we want to be legitimate right we and we want to be a self sustaining industry that doesn't have every year more and more people dropping out because they're losing their shirts because something with regulations or something with you know uh finance or whatever is 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 kicking their ass dude so yeah, yeah. And, and i'm i'm speaking from personal experience right now so <laughs> yeah the industry's wild yeah. we're the wild wild west still 
but but yeah. it's evolving and it's it's growing in, yeah. in some ways and you know i think it's stabilizing in other ways which i think is really great yeah. so yeah no once again let's celebrate that that one step closer to safe banking dude that that's gonna make so much difference yeah. right? so much difference yeah yeah, so oh. so we went we went back uh, a couple years back and we started doing a bunch of land rate stuff like packets and anything. Job Kush, um, yeah, PCK is awesome. Of, so, dude, let me tell you, the stuff that we started to get out of that, the terpene yeah. profiles and and just just amazing stuff. So, um, yeah. you know, there's something to be said for the old school genetics, man. You know, land race is old school genetics. There's some Absolutely. there's some power back there still. So. Well, now with like Thailand opening up and Asia opening up, there's a whole new uh, group of terpenes that we can start going after and, and flavor profiles. If you talk about, you know, green tea ice cream or fried chicken, fried chicken, most people don't want to smoke stuff that smells like fried chicken, but you, you take it over there and they like savory more than sweet, yep. I think. Yep. Yep. And so, you know, South Korea goes online. We're going to have some kimchi okay. cannabis. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> That'll be awesome, dude. It, yeah. it, you know, so there's been such a bottleneck in yeah. in U.S. genetics, right? Like, like if, you know, I, I'm I'm geeky this way, so I, I started to create a chart. I, I was using the the um, seedfinder.eu.com, right? So, um, yeah. So I start to go back and and I start to make a chart of like all of the crosses of the stuff that that was popular today, right? You know, yeah. GG and da 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 da, right? So. Dude, when these are just said crosses, I what? think a lot of people. I, I think a lot of people take the data on Seed Finder as fact, and I know for a fact a lot of it is incorrect. Just because somebody says it's one thing doesn't necessarily mean right. it isn't. Fair, fair, but still, fair there's enough. a lot of information there. But but when you go when you take a lot of the of the of the current genetics and you start to yeah. go back to grandparents, great grandparents, dude, you were all at the same fucking shit. It like literally, yeah. it all came from like six or eight different varieties created like like the thousands of varieties we have today like you know yeah. it's it's the um durbin was one of them you know so so the the, the the durbin self was was one was a big parent the afghani that went into the early cookies like literally dude like like and the cushion like, yeah yeah it's it's there's a lot there's a lot of similarity in what we do these days then it goes back yeah to, so so Reggie, if people want to find out more about you, what you're doing, where can they find you online? Oh, um, so it's uh, it's Argadino at FrontRangeBio.com. Um, I I was told that our our website no longer works, so don't go to our website. Um, yeah, <laughs> but just uh, yeah, so just Reg uh, Argadino R G A U D I N O at FrontRangeBio.com, and I'm happy to answer nice. questions if you. Anybody have any questions? I mean, I get back to you the same day, but I always get back to people who ask me some questions. So, awesome! You have an Instagram or social media, or you I, avoid I, that I, stuff? I, I, I try to avoid it like a plague, but I do have an Instagram. It's Doctor Reggie Godino. Nice. Uh, all all one word. So, and there's not much on there, um, but I, I do have some pictures of of uh, my last breeding harvest, uh, which where I went. Uh, I found a really amazing cut of strawberry og it was like this really sweet kerosene and yeah. uh and i went nuts with that sucker dude i bred it to everything <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome so, so i have yeah uh, when you find a good one that's the best right. way to approach so, it um and so yeah so i so i have a few pictures and some stuff some of the stuff that comes out of frb because well, i'm not a big instagram i'm not a big social media guy so when, when I am when I am reminded by the company to push it on my Instagram, I do. So there's a few things of, of some of our latest stuff. But um, yeah, that's where we, where we can find it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thanks. Take care, guys. Cheers. Cheers.